Knowledge for Men, episode 43. Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where boys turn into men, where men turn into leaders, into lions, the ferocious few who stand strong, a place where you grow to become the man you were born to be. It's time to take massive action towards the life you want, get the health, get the relationships, business, and career you've always dreamed of, achieve a level of success and happiness that you've been searching for for so many years. Life has given you enough, and it's time to take a stand and take full control of your life. Stand with us as we interview the most inspiring and successful leaders to give Give you real world advice to crush life and awaken the sleeping giant inside of you. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. It's the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website, blog, e commerce store, or online portfolio. For a free 14 day trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code knowledge, or simply go to squarespace.com slash knowledge for men. It's a great platform for anyone getting started or looking to switch over to something easy to use with a great design. Again, that's offer code knowledge or squarespace.com slash knowledge for men for a free 14 day trial and 10% off. All right, guys, I'm here with John Romanello. He's a strength coach, investor, model, and author. He recently published Man 2.0, Engineering the Alpha, A Real-World Guide to an Unreal Life, which debuted at number four on the New York Times bestseller list. All right, John, let's do this. Welcome to the show. Let's go. I'm excited to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure, John. Let's roll right in with your favorite success quote and why. I forget, I forget who said this. I don't know who I should be crediting here, but it is be bold and powerful forces will mobilize to your aid or, or fortune favors the bold. Another way to put it is scared money don't make money. Yeah, I just am heavily in favor of taking risks. I really believe in swinging for the fences. I, I think I wrote this in a blog post once that on the tomb of no heroes, will you find the words he played it safe? Because I really don't think there's a lot of value in doing that. So for me, it's really come up with the most ambitious thing you can think about and just go after it with the highest level of aggression that you can muster. So just go all in and make it happen. For sure. Absolutely. All right, John, let's learn more about you. Let's learn about your story and share with the audience your journey of how you got started with what you do. Sure. So for anyone who doesn't know, what I do now is I really function as a coach a writer and content creator. I write for a bunch of magazines. I've written several books or several ebooks, one hardcover book. And But prior to that, I was a personal trainer working in and around New York City. And it was going well, but you know, it, it's something that I had been doing for a while and I was looking for the next thing. I was, I was thinking about buying a gym or opening one and wasn't really sure what to do. And for me, it was always a foregone conclusion that I would write a book and I was sort of working on a treatment for one. And starting from the time I was about 20 years old, I had been writing for fitness magazines. And so then eventually it occurred to me that I should start writing more rather than trying to focus on something like open a gym, which was a a really, I think, an ambitious goal and a good goal for a lot of people. But to get bogged down with the mundane inanity of of the day-to-day drudgery of running a business, I think was n- would not have been good for me. I'm not particularly good at minutia, is a way to put it. So I think it would not have been a good thing for me. So really, it just I decided my talents really lie in writing and communication. So let's figure out how to do that most effectively and see if we can make money doing it. And thankfully, that's really how it got started. So I started my blog in 2009. And with zero readers, so not, not even my mom, I think, clicked over. And slowly but surely, built up a following. And then after six months, launched my first online program, my first ebook, Final Face Fat Loss, which did very, very well. And it's been rocking and rolling ever since. So I went from having a mailing list of 900 people to 20,000 people. And over the past four years, it's doubled and doubled again. And so now I'm, I've got 80,000 people who strangely care what I have to say. And uh, it's been really awesome. It's it's led me to do a lot of really cool things and meet a lot of really awesome people. And so that's sort of how it all began. There was just a moment of clarity where I realized I should be writing more. And then an opportunity to do so or, or an understanding of how to do it presented itself, which we can talk about as well. I can see how you're drawn to opening up your gym because it seems like the next step in a personal trainer's career or or the dream, right? 
But that's just the mainstream idea or like what society would kind of expect of you to do. But instead, you listen to your heart and your desire, which was writing. And that led to a lot of success for you. So, John, what originally got you involved in fitness and health? Were you overweight growing up? What really led you down the path of fitness? Yeah, I was always what you would call a thick kid, you know, high level of musculature underneath a bunch of fat, never really like a fat kid, but always just sort of chubby, never lean. And that really was just sort of my lot in life. I did play sports when I was in middle school and high school, but mainly because I was sort of this super nerdy, academic, bookish sort of kid. And I had all these, you know, I was on like the chess club. And at some point, my guidance counselor said, maybe you should, you know, do something physical and be more appealing to colleges. So I played sports, but was it was never like the my primary outlet of expression. And so then high school ended, I was in college, things stopped. And I went from being sort of chubby to really chubby. And one day I saw this, I saw this picture of myself that had been taken in, I, I think Disney World of all places. I was standing next to Minnie Mouse, if I, if I recall correctly. And I just was like, Jesus, am I that fat? I had this belly and my, you know, I, when you get like chubby face and you smile and like your eyes disappear, it was like that. And I felt that who I was internally was not externally manifested. So I thought, how can I make that happen? I think I'm this hardworking, diligent, knowledgeable person. And yet for whatever reason, I look like this lazy, fat, stupid slob. At least that was the sort of impression that I took. I don't know that others would have seen it that way. But at that point, you're sort of in, you know, when you're 20 years old, you're sort of in the height of your self-loathing period anyway. And so I dove in again, being a nerdy bookish sort of guy. My first instinct was to read everything I could. And I read and I read and, and eventually I was ready to take action. And I was still hesitating. I was sort of on the doorstep. And then I was fortunate enough to meet a woman whose husband was opening up a gym very close to my house and sort of that was the call to adventure for me. And from there, I, I managed to get to the gym and this guy became my mentor. And that was the moment for me. So as soon as I walked in that gym, this guy, Alvin Batista, sort of took me under his wing. And I went through this dramatic transformation where I went from having a 35 inch waist to a 28 inch waist in about eight weeks. It was just an unbelievable, I lost like 30 pounds in just an incredibly short period of time. Some things I was doing incorrectly, but also it just turns out I'm, I have pretty decent fitness genetics. I was just super lazy and never took advantage. And so that's really how it started for me. I was, I was this chubby kid and then I got fit and it changed every conceivable aspect of my life. I went from being in the friend zone to being the hot guy very, very quickly. And so this, this all happened prior to summer. And so the difference between summer in 2001 and 2002 were just radically different. And uh, I thought, this is, this is pretty crazy how your entire life can change because you get a six pack. And it, and it was really weird. And it you know, made me think along the lines of why does this happen? Why do we react this way? Is it just because I'm more confident? Do people really care this much about appearances? And I sort of went down this interesting journey. And I realized that although there was a lot more to learn and a lot more to do, it was something that I could help other people with. And then when I finished school, decided I, you know, I didn't want to pursue more education for the time being. And I wanted to train because it was something that I had been doing and something that I liked. And it turned into this business, this thing that I did. So that's, uh, that's a big part of it. <laughs> that's the story right there. You were a little overweight and had some challenges with your appearance and had some confidence issues. And just so the listeners can see, do you have any before and after photos on the site? I mean, there, there are some before pictures of me floating around the internet. So if you Google image, you'll see them. But uh, yeah, I, got, I actually, I don't know that I've ever put together like an actual before and after, mainly because in my head, you know, there's always this hatred for that person that I was. I don't, I, yeah, I, I still to this day don't really care much for looking at pictures of when I was chubby. It's, it's something that still weirds me out. <laughs> well, it's no longer you now. Well, John, I know it hasn't been easy trying to get this body and build this business that you have. Can you share with the audience some challenge or a massive failure that you've had and how you overcame that? Uh, actually, the thing was, it was more of a perception of failure. So I graduated from school and I double majored in psychobiology and English and I minored in history. And so I had this this big degree from this prestigious school and Really, I mean, there's not a lot you could do with that. I was sort of on track to becoming a professional student and going to grad school and, you know, maybe getting a PhD or whatever. 
So I was the first kid in my family to go to college. And this was really important to my family. And I had to take out loans and get scholarships to be able to go to school. I come from a single parent family. My mother worked her ass off to put me through school. And I worked my ass off to do it. It was uh, during my senior year and I was primarily focusing on psychology. And I realized I did not want to do clinical psych. It was not something I had the stomach for dealing with people who had schizophrenia and just watching their families fall apart. I was like, I, I can't be a part of this. And so really the failure in a lot of ways was like I went to school and I got this degree that I knew I had no intention or ability to use. But bright side is you could go to grad school. You could do something with it. And instead, I decided to focus on being a personal trainer, which my mother did not consider to be a real job. And uh, she was like, what are you going to do? Work in a gym, make $8 an hour all your life, you know, like go to work in your pajamas. And so it was about a year and a half or two years of just just like really being in a bad spot, a bad relationship with my family who were in a lot of ways just super disappointed in the path that I had chosen. And so regard me not so much as a failure, but sort of as um, as someone who gave up. And I think at the time I might've been lying to myself. I was certainly lying to them. I was just like, well, I'm going to take a year off and then I'll go to grad school. And then a year became two. But I knew from very early on that my passion was fitness and helping people. So what it really taught me was that you have to make sacrifices. And if you're going to do the thing that you love, sometimes you will need to undergo a number of trials and you will need to prove yourself to the people that care about you. And for me, I decided to quantify things. And I thought for my mom, you know, coming from a poor family, if I can make $100,000 a year, if I can have a six-figure salary doing what I do, then she will have to consider it a quote-unquote real job. And so that became my goal. My goal was then to make $100,000 in a year so that I could prove to my mom that I was not a failure, that I had not <laughs> squandered my education or my talents. And to, to some extent, it worked. But really, really, um, things were, were rough for a while with my family. I mean, they were just not pleased with the fact that I was this guy going to work in sweatpants with this Ivy League degree. <laughs> so that was a big thing. It was a big, big challenge for me. And thankfully, obviously, this is years ago now. Everything worked out. My mom is proud beyond measure to have a son that's written a New York Times bestseller, certainly. But it was really hard for her early on to see how I could have any sort of successful life at that point. So, John, what kept you going? I mean, you said you're going to work in your sweatpants. You have an Ivy League degree. I mean, what kept you going? That You probably didn't see significant results for quite some time. Well, the thing was, I've always had a really, really high level of belief about myself, right? And so I've always been a writer before I was anything else. That was what I think I was born to do. I've been writing since I was eight years old. And I remember when I was eight, I told my mom, I want to write a book. And she asked me why. And I said, because books make me happy and I want to make other people happy too. And so then fast forward to right around the time I wanted to go through this physical transformation. What did I say that I did? The first place I looked was books. And so I realized, well, someone wrote these books and I'm a better writer than these people. So all I need to do is collect enough information and have enough experience and then I'll write a book. So for me, training the entire time, I knew that I could eventually be successful. I could eventually write about what I was doing. And that was sort of what kept me going. Actually, I had my first fitness article published about, it might've been nine months after, or 10 months after I went through my initial transformation. It was that quick because I was just so intent on writing. And so I went through this transformation when I was about 19 years old, right before my 20th birthday. And then when I was 20 years old, I got my first article published on Teenage, which is a huge bodybuilding site. And that was, and all, you know, it was nice because I was in college and they paid me like 500 bucks or whatever it was. So for me, it was always, as long as you can write, you can write about this. And as long as you can write about this, you can write a book that helps people and changes people's lives. To whatever degree I thought it was going to be successful, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe... Maybe when I was 20, I had delusions about writing the next body for life or whatever. But I just knew that there were people making tons of money and changing hundreds of millions of people's lives with writing about fitness. And I did not see any reason that I could not do that as well, because I have just always believed from the time I was eight years old that I would write a great book. And you're talking about Man 2.0 right now. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly not the only book that I'll write, but I, I certainly am very proud of it. I, you know, being as objective as I can now, having some distance, I think it was probably 75% of the book it could have been or that I would like it to have been. There were some things that I would have added if I had more time and some distance from it. But every single day, and I mean this, every single day I get an email from someone or someone posting on my Facebook or someone tweeting at me, your book changed my life. It was the best thing I've ever read. I'm starting my journey. Thank you so much. And to know that I wrote a book that did for these guys what someone else's book did for me 12 years ago is huge for me. And so that is really satisfying. And that feels like success. Forget the money, forget the 60,000 Twitter followers or whatever it is. That If I had one guy, if I wrote that book and had one guy email me, if I could change his life the way somebody else changed mine, the way Alvin helped me change mine, that would be success to me. Right. And you're having an impact on someone's life and changing the entire course, the direction of their life. It's, it's incredible. And you're doing it by the thousands. So now, John, let's talk about Man 2.0, engineering the alpha. Can you share with the listeners some of the main concepts? So the action points on the cover of the book say, build more muscle, burn more fat, have more sex. It is a fitness book. But it's also only partially a fitness book. There are a lot of things in Man 2.0, in what, what we just call Alpha, that are about self-development. You know, I believe that my fitness journey was just the first of many transformations I've made. And I believe that the skills that I learned there, the confidence that I gained from having done this thing that I never thought I would do, was portable. I lived my whole life thinking, I'm a chubby guy. I'm always going to be chubby. I'm always going to be the chubby, funny guy. I'm always going to be in the friend zone. And I believed it with the same intensity that I believed, the same level of just flat matter of fact belief that I know the sun rises in the east. You go to bed and you're like, the sun's going to rise in the east tomorrow and I will be a chubby kid. And then one day I changed it. I took control of my body and I undertook this journey And then I was no longer a chubby kid. And for me, it really was very much like now the sun rises in the West because I said so. For no other reason than I decided the sun will rise in the West. That is where the sun will be tomorrow morning. And when you've accomplished something that you previously thought was impossible, it's really easy to accomplish other things which other people are impossible or which, you you know, other things which you might have once upon a time thought were impossible. You know, I knew I would write a best-selling book. I knew that I would have all this success in the industry or get a seven-figure book deal. I knew that I could do these things. Everyone else thought they were crazy. Everyone else said no first-time author debuts on the, you know, very, very few first-time authors debut on the New York Times bestseller list. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it. And everyone said, no first time author gets offered a seven figure book deal. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm probably going to do that. So the book is really about learning that fitness is one path, not just to make a change, but to learn the process of change, to develop the skill set of achieving the impossible or things that you would have thought were impossible. And so I really do believe that fitness is a legitimate path to becoming a better person, developing yourself. It's not the only path. Some people go through a spiritual transformation or or an emotional transformation. For me, it happened to be physical. And it's certainly the thing that I'm most qualified to write about. And it's really interesting that I've had so many guys experiencing that same thing. So there is a, a great program in there that'll help you burn fat and build muscle. There's a lot of stuff in there that is intended to help you increase testosterone and overcome these physical issues, which, you know, the the physical world we live in presses upon us. And so there are guys who are building more muscle, burning more fat and having a lot more sex. But the program is secondary to the information in the book, which states very clearly that once you do this, you'll begin to realize that you could do just about anything else. And so that's really what the book is about. It's a hero's journey. And that's how we present it in the book. A hero's journey. I like that. It's about mastering the process of transformation and using fitness as a tool to start with, which can then be applied into any aspect of your life. I like that, John. And for the guys listening, John, what do you recommend for burning fat and also for gaining lean muscle? The overarching theme is hormonal optimization. 
It's eating in a way that first helps you bring insulin under control and then training in a way that allows you to maximize testosterone production and then from there gearing both of those things in a way that would allow you to produce more growth hormone. And these things individually help you lose fat and gain muscle, but collectively they help you do both at the same time, which is really great. And so guys get stronger, they get leaner. In terms of the diet, there's a lot in there. We've got the, the basic, thematically everything really stems from intermittent fasting in terms of the diet. There's sort of a, a 16-8 schedule that we use, you know, so you're, you're fasting 16 hours out of the day and eating during this eight hour window. During phases two and four, there's a cheat day once per week. Phase one is really very low carb. Phase three is higher carb because it's all about building muscle. And then each phase has its own specific training program that goes along with the diet. So what I would say is if you guys listening to the podcast are interested in the specific methods I've written about most of them on my fitness website, romanfitnesssystems.com. And if you go to engineeringthealpha.com, you can actually download a free chapter of the book that will will give you a lot of this information. So you will find at least you'll, you'll be able to scratch the surface just by reading the stuff on my blog. And if you are interested from there, please absolutely buy the book. I would love that. All right. I'll be putting that in the show notes, guys. And let's talk about the title, Engineering the Alpha. Yeah. So what is your definition? What does it mean to be an alpha? For me, part of writing this book was really taking that term back. So, you know, I know a lot of guys in the like the pickup community and the seduction community. And so they use that term in a really interesting way. And and it's not one that I particularly care for. When that term is used in most contexts, it's sort of, you know, about amogging, right? Being the alpha male of a group, which I think is sort of a damaging way to look at self-development. Why do we have entire industries which are telling guys that they should work on being the alpha male of a group? That means that if you're doing that, if your entire goal is to be the alpha of a specific group of people or of if you want to be the biggest guy in any room you walk into, eventually you're going to be disappointed. Someone's going to be bigger or better looking or funnier or smarter or make more money or more successful or more famous or whatever else, right? So – to gear self-development around trying to be better than other people is really damaging because not only is it, is it sort of a road that ultimately can't lead everywhere, it's, there's no value in defining yourself based only on how you measure up or above other guys or other people. Why would you do that? So for us, being alpha is all about trying to become the best possible version of yourself, being the strongest version of you, the biggest version of you, the leanest version of you, whatever, the, the sexiest or smartest or, or most successful version of you. And we really do want to encourage people to, to really just measure themselves against their previous selves, like comparing yourself to other people, however favorably you might come out in that particular comparison really is not doing you any favors. And so that's really what I advise against. So then what makes a man or what are your thoughts on the status of men in society today? I mean, I'm 100% for equality for women. Yet it's clear women have made significant strides in the last 50 years where men may have stagnated. What are your thoughts on this? I think that society expects, cultivates and demands different things from men than it used to. We are expected to be more sensitive. We're expected to be more communicative than we would have been 20, 30 years ago. We are expected to behave differently. And I think all of these things are ultimately good because one of the only ways that women as a gender, that feminism could have advanced so far so quickly, and I think one of the only ways we could have made such rapid strides toward gender equality one of the only ways for that to happen would be if men were willing to change as well. If every guy was still functioning under the assumption that he had to be the sole breadwinner and then the majority of women want jobs and careers, that would create a lot of distress within romantic, even in, even friendly relationships, platonic relationships. So I think that because women have been making so many changes, we've had to adapt to that. And I think that's by and large a positive thing. But to your point, I definitely think that there has been... Just men have become more passive. 
passive. That's a real, yeah, okay, that's a really, really great way to put it, right? If you look at the way men were portrayed in the 50s and 60s, even in film, there were Steve McQueen. You know, he was this, he was just a badass and, you know, like racing cars and fighting and shooting things and like, you know, and like he was a man who was not to be messed with. And, you know, I just use Steve McQueen as one example, but every guy in every movie was like that. And obviously there are different types of men. What is disturbing to me is the trend of portraying men in media, particularly on television and in film as milk toast, lackluster shells. It's like every guy is suddenly the dude from Everybody Loves Raymond. Every guy on TV is just, he's trying to hide things from his wife because he's afraid of her. His wife controls the house. No, she's the smart one. I just do what I'm told. Happy wife, happy life. Stuff like that. So I think that in our rush to display it to everyone or display to, to the world writ large that we are willing to put women in positions of power we have taken the right to be powerful away from men in the media. And I think that has some pretty deleterious effects on how men perceive themselves because in part, we draw our understanding of normalcy and of, of expected behavior from media. It's just, it's, that's just how it is. So I think men are, are more passive and not just because women are more aggressive, but because we're sort of lazy right? It's easier to let other people make decisions for us. This is something that that a lot of people do, men and women. And of course, there is sort of, on both ends of the spectrum, there is this sort of like androgenization of gender. Men are becoming, physically speaking, have over the past 10 years begun adapting habits that are typically associated with women and vice versa. And so you have in the 90s and, and 2000s, you know, starting in the late 90s and into the mid 2000s, the rise of the metrosexual guys waxing their eyebrows, getting manicures and pedicures and all of a sudden focusing. Every guy wanted to focus on dressing really nicely and like, and guys have like skincare regimens and all these other things. And I think that's great. I mean, I have a I have a great skincare regimen. I get pedicures once a month, but I do think that it can go too far for anyone's good because the shift towards passivity and towards, I really can't call it anything other than vanity, right? I mean, that's the thing. Like, if you're if you're going out of your way all the time to look your best, it's because you're vain, and because society expects you to be vain. And so, men have become more superficial because we seem to be expected to, and we've become more passive. And when you have a generation of guys who are both superficial and passive, you have a generation of weak-willed men who are willing. To be everybody loves Raymond. They're willing to let women boss them around. They're willing to let people boss them around. They're getting stepped on at work. And every now and again, you have someone who is more of the traditional definition of an alpha. And that's the guy that's going to take control. That's the guy who's not going to let other people push him around. And he's the one who's going to get attention. And so I'm really big on reclaiming certain aspects of masculinity. I really believe in being a retro metro. You know, I believe in being well groomed. I believe in being well versed in books and music and wine and food. But I also believe that you should know how to change a tire. I am a proponent of capability for both men and women. Men should know how to cook. Just because it's during the post. World War II baby boomer generation, that was something that was assigned into the, the women's category of gender roles, cooking, doesn't mean you shouldn't know how to do it. Just like you should know how to comb your hair and you should know how to clip your nails and you should know where to get a nice suit. You should know how to wear a nice suit, but you should also know how to cook. You should also know how to change your tire. You should know how to do things. And it's amazing to me how many men I know who don't know how to change a tire. I don't necessarily think that automotive maintenance is the hallmark of masculinity or, or uh, even of capability. I just see that as emblematic and symptomatic of men not knowing how to handle themselves in their environment. You know, if you drive a car, you should know how to change a tire because it might go flat. 
You should know how to put gas in your car. It's the same thing. Listen, if you if you live in New York City and you you don't drive a car, sure, you should not know how you don't need to know how to change a tire, but you should know how to take the subway. My thing is that everyone should be completely capable in their environment. And it seems that this generation of men has completely foregone capability in favor of passivity, narcissism, and superficiality. And I think that's that's the danger. So my, my point is that, like, I don't want to be one of those guys who say, fuck it, men should act like men and club women over the head and drag them back to their cave. Because I don't, you know, I, the idea of a generation of strong women, and I see from a logical perspective why the rapid increase in the strength of women en masse has led to the backsliding of men in terms of their assertiveness. But I think now that it's time for the pendulum to stabilize and for us to enter into this, you know, this next millennium, this next century, this net, the, the decade, you know, that we're, that we're in, I think it's now time for us to collectively seek partnership and real equality. And that means that, no, your wife isn't always going to be right. No, you don't have to take the path of least resistance every time your boss or your brother or your, your wife or whoever disagrees with you. You're allowed to have an opinion and you should have an opinion and you should make sure it's an informed opinion because that's your responsibility as a functioning member of society. And as a man, it's your responsibility to take responsibility for your own life and not let others dictate whether you can do this or you can do that. Whether that's a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. You've got to step up and say, you know, I've had enough. And now I'm going to go after what I want in life. That's good. That's good stuff, John. And now it's time for the knowledge round. Are you ready? Let's do it. Have you ever tried to set up a website and just give up? Did you get overwhelmed? Was there just so much content available that you just put that project aside? Well, Squarespace makes it easy to quickly get a professional site up and running so you can focus on doing the things that you like doing and not coding. Squarespace is constantly improving their platform with new features, new designs, and even better support. They have beautiful designs for you to start with and all the style options you need to create a unique website for your personal taste and brand. It's incredibly easy to use, and if you need support, I know Squarespace has an amazing support team that works 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. They even have a great support team with over 100 employees. I guess in New York City, the office has been codenamed the Care Bear Lair. (laughs) And that's not it, guys. You can get started for as little as $8 a month, and this includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. It's a great deal, and that includes hosting, you guys. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your site. So your content will look great on every device, every time. That's Really big, guys. Mobile is the future. If you sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use offer code KNOWLEDGE or simply go to squarespace.com slash knowledge for men to get 10% off your first purchase and a show support for knowledge for men. Welcome to the knowledge round where the guests will be asked rapid fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, two, one, showtime. All right, John, how would you explain Man 2.0, Engineering the Alpha, to a newcomer? Engineering the Alpha is a complete resource for men who want to look, feel, and perform like a better version of themselves. All right, well said. And John, what advice would you give to someone who's feeling lost or unsure of their purpose? Find a mentor. I think that would be the biggest thing. Find a mentor, someone who has been there before. I think that would be the most high yield, high leverage thing you can do. Right. Mentors can be such a powerful resource. And John, what was holding you back from becoming the man you are today? Wow. What was, you know what? Honestly, I was, I got stuck for a while in being a traditional alpha. I, from the time I was around 22 until I was 27 or 28, I continued to grow in a lot of ways, but there were a few ways that I sort of stopped growing. And it seems like looking back at it, it seems almost intentional. I just focused on shallow relationships. And, you know, I had a lot of sex with a lot of women. I think I needed to do it and get it out of my system. And I think that many, many guys, not every guy, but many, many guys need to go through that phase. Looking back, I think that staying in that phase as long as I did 
was probably a function of recognizing that getting out of it would require a lot of work. To get to a point where I didn't want to go to a bar and bang some random broad, where I wanted to really connect with a woman the way I had connected with my male friends, would take a lot of work and a lot of time. And I think that I just, for a while, I didn't want to be bothered. You know, so it, for me, it was just a matter of getting to a point where I wanted to do that work. And I'm really glad I did. So what did that work look like for you? A couple of periods of celibacy, some dramatic changes to the way I interacted with women, just dramatically and purposefully changing the way I interacted with women. I don't know. It's crazy. Like, you know, I, I know a lot of guys who got into like the pickup community because that was a pain point for them. They didn't know how to talk to women. They didn't know how to sleep with women. It's not something that I ever had a problem with. It's something that even when I was like in the friend zone, when I was a chubby guy, eventually I'd be like, so we're friends, we should fuck, right? And it would work. So I, I mean, I've, I've never had trouble meeting women, talking to women, sleeping with women. So, you know, like when you go to a bar with a group of guys and there's that one dude who's like nervous and he has to like really like work himself up to go talk to a girl. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I'm the literal opposite of that. Like when I'm in a bar, you know, for a long time, it was really, really hard for me not to talk to a girl. It just happened automatically. I would just, or uh, uh, in, in much the same way that like guys have to talk themselves up and psych themselves up to go hit on a woman, I would have to talk myself away from it. I would just have to have conversations with myself where I was like, you know what? You don't need to talk to this girl. Sleeping with her is not going to do anything. Hang out with your friends. Just stay here. And, and it was like this ongoing dialogue where I really had to pull myself away from, from doing that because I think it was causing some, some serious problems for me. So that was a big thing, just like really trying not to hit on girls, learning how to be in a bar and not just be flirting all the time, just learning how to be in any environment and not be trying to see which one of these girls do I, do I want to sleep with. Like it, it, it was an interesting period of growth. So there was, uh, you know, a couple of periods where I was, t I told myself, I'm just not going to, I'm going to be celibate for a month and I wouldn't have sex with anyone. So because I lived that sort of lifestyle, even when I went on dates, I, I just was sort of, I was just like, well, if we, I, I was the kind of guy who would have sex on the first date. And, but I was never the kind of guy who would have sex on the first date and then not talk to that girl anymore because I was raised by a single mother and, and I have a sister and I was always raised that, that guy, the guy who, you know, hooks up with a girl and never calls her is an asshole and not wanting to be an asshole was a big driving force for me. So I would sleep with these girls and then I would call them. And because I didn't want to be a dick, you know, I didn't want to be a bad guy. I was trying to be a good guy. And so I would call them and I would give them all these indications that I was interested in them. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, so I kind of want you to be my boyfriend. And then I would have to break their hearts. So for me, it became about looking at that behavior and figuring out what I'm doing to consistently encourage women to, to do this. So it went from being the kind of guy who would sleep with a girl on the first date to being the kind of guy who does not, I do not kiss on the, I mean, I'm married now, but even up until I met my wife, I just, I do not kiss on the first date. So, you know, being the kind of guy who wouldn't sleep with a girl until sometimes two months into a relationship, because I really wanted to be sure. You know, I was very, very focused on not making those mistakes again that I had made, you know, from the time I was 22 until 26 or 27. So from the time I was 27 until I was 30, when I met my wife, I was really, really focused on making those changes and not being a guy who was ruled by his libido, who was ruled by his passions. I, I just wanted to be someone who, I wanted to be more in control than I felt I had been historically. And so when you did this, did you find that your relationships with women dramatically improved? I mean, obviously it worked out, you, I mean, you have a wife now. It, it made them dramatically less complicated because I, I guess I just attach a lot of responsibility to sex because I don't want to be an asshole. Even though I'm perfectly fine with casual sex, I would sleep with these girls and then I would call them. And, and so once I sort of stopped sleeping with women until I was sure that I actually liked them, that stopped complicating my life. That made my life less dramatic, I guess is the best way to put it. Because instead of 
being in a situation where I'd be like, Jesus, this chick is like clingy and I'm not, I don't really want her here and I don't know what to say. Instead, if you haven't slept with a girl after six dates, because you're not sure if you're interested, it usually leads to a very adult conversation. And being able to have that conversation, usually after six dates, if you haven't made a move on a girl, she's, you know, a, a woman, I'll say, because we're, you know, 28, I would, we, women, not girls. I apologize for any women listening. In my experience, they would ask, so what's going on? Where is this going? And I would say, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure yet. Like, I think you're cool, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily feeling as connected as I think I would like to be feeling at this stage. And it's pretty interesting that if you are spending time with someone, but you're not being physical, it does tend to make it easier to walk away, at least for me. And so it changed things with women because it, it made things less dramatic. All right, so you started to really focus on connecting with the girls and ensuring there was something there other than physical attraction, which made your relationships less dramatic. And you mentioned no sex for six to eight dates. I'll have to think about that one. <laughs> All right, and John, what are your three most influential books and why? Uh, the first one is easy. It is a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. It's probably Campbell's seminal work and really outlines his theories on what he calls the monomyth, which is this understanding that ultimately take the same path and that there, there's this universal structure to the way we tell and the way we relate to stories as humans. And, and this sort of it, – it's, it's really interesting. Like if you, if you could go back and, and take Star Wars, if you could tell the story of Star Wars to people around a campfire – 5,000, 10,000 years ago, they would understand it because it's the same type of, it's the same story as Hercules, more or less. Harry Potter is the same story as King Arthur. They're ultimately this, these very similar things. And so Campbell really outlined this in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, I think, best. And that book really helped me understand that not only as a storyteller, but also I think that The Hero's Journey, The Monomyth, is a really good lens for looking at your life and all of the individual journeys that we take, whether it is a fitness journey or a business journey or a journey to become the type of person who can have a successful relationship, a marriage, all of those journeys take the same path. And I think that book really helped me there. So that's hugely influential. I, I highly recommend that to everyone. Uh, the Lord of the Rings has been a huge, huge influence on me. I'm a big Tolkien nerd. I actually have a Lord of the Rings tattoo on my ribs. And then... Uh, the honestly, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to my boy Tim Ferriss. I I really think that Four Hour Work Week was was one of the more influential books I read because it showed that other people were able to to do this thing and achieve this success as entrepreneurs, and it really encouraged me to do the same. So I, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Oh, you know what? Here's another one that actually had a big influence on me. Tucker Max's I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. But not for the reasons most people would think, so let me clarify. I started reading Tucker's work on his website. I mean, it's got to be like at least – I was, I was in high school, so you know, I might have been 18 or 19. So I mean this is 12 or 13 years ago now. And so Tucker's work was influential on me because it showed me the importance of storytelling. Tucker, whatever you think about the content of his work, you really do need to – except that he, he has a really good way of writing creative nonfiction. And I think that, you know, I was really inspired by the fact that Tucker just told these stories about his life and eventually someone paid him to turn it into a book and a movie. And, you know, and I, I, think, that's, I think that's really great. I think that that was a big inspiration to me, particularly when I, I first started writing. And I thought, if this guy can do this just writing about girls he banged, I can do it writing about fitness for sure. So that was inspiring to me, if not influential for those reasons. All right. And John, can you name a mentor or someone who said something to you that really had an impact on your life? What did he or she say to you? Yeah. Again, I mentioned him earlier, my mentor, Alvin Batista. So I met Alvin when I was 19 years old. My parents split up when I was nine. My dad was an abusive guy and... So, you know, I didn't really have a relationship with him after that point. And so, I, you know, I went through my adolescence really not having a real father figure. And then I met Alvin, who really, I mean, he took me under his wing in every conceivable way. You know, he paid for my first personal training certification. He gave me dozens of books to read, some of which are still on my shelves to this day. 
I learned more about being a man from just being with Alvin, like working with him as an employee in one year than I, than I ever have from anyone else. Like just little things that nobody teaches you that, that you just sort of learn being part of society. Like when are you expected to reach out and pick up a check or when is it okay to let other people buy you dinner or Alvin's got three beautiful daughters. So I, I learned a lot about fatherhood, not from my own dad, but from watching Alvin with his kids and watching how he is with his wife and how he interacts with his friends. Yeah. So Alvin, Alvin Batista, real, real huge influence on me. Great, great guy. He is my Obi-Wan. Your Obi-Wan. Haven't heard that one before. All right. If you could go back in time, it's a scenario for you, John, and you can have 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? Oh, my God. I would I would tell my 20-year-old self, don't stop writing. There was a period where I got really, really focused on modeling and, and bodybuilding, and I stopped writing for a while, and I sort of like let that fall off. So I would immediately tell him, do not stop writing no matter what, just keep writing, writing stories, put things together, everything that happens to you, write it down. And I would tell him to take more pictures. It's really crazy to me that looking back at at that time in my life when I was the, my friends were around me all the time. We always just like partied and laughed and you know, that there's not, because guys just don't take a lot of pictures. We, you know, there's always, hopefully whatever you, wherever you go, there's always one chick there documenting things. I think it's different with Instagram now, but I, I do, I do feel that there aren't enough pictures from my youth, you know, and, and I would, uh, I would like those. So just, yeah, just in, enjoy the time being young and having no responsibilities and, and causing trouble. There are, there are a few girls I might tell 20 year old John to avoid, but then again, if I had not dated those girls, I wouldn't have had the experiences and learned the lessons that I learned that have, you know, I think in many ways helped me on, on the path. I like that. And John, what are a few things that guys could do to really work on their masculinity and help them become you know, more of the man that they want to become? I think that one thing all guys can do is learn how to tell a really, really great story. Read about storytelling. Read about, watch people who are great storytellers or great orators. Learning how to tell a story effectively helps you in so many ways. It helps you understand your own story better and it helps you listen. It really, it does. If you if you understand the the craft of storytelling, it does allow you to listen to people more effectively. And I think there's value there. So if you learn, if you appreciate and and study storytelling, you will have a really easy time analyzing your life and realizing where in the story you are now. And that I think pays a lot of dividends in terms of self improvement. All right. And John, what's one underrated characteristic that you think like could provide massive benefit and significant results if guys would work on it? Honestly, manners. Manners. Just being polite, being chivalrous. I was raised to have exceptionally genteel manners in many ways. I, For example, I'm one of the only guys I've ever met that will stand every time a woman leaves or approaches the table. I you know, I, I open the door, door for people as often as I can. I always say please and thank you. When I order food at a restaurant, I always say may I? May I please have a, a ribeye steak, medium rare please? Or what? I don't, you know, I don't say, all right, can I get the, uh, you know, let me get the, the steak. It's really interesting to me that I will go to dinners with or lunches with, with a publisher or with potential producers for, for TV shows and every single time I'm at a meeting like that, it's something that gets commented on. I was at dinner with my wife and, and a friend of ours, and another woman joined us for dinner wh- whom I had not met at that point. But, you know, she's, um, she's a, a celebrity-ish. She's a, um, a TV actress. And um, she commented on your manners? Uh, yeah. It, it just it, – it, not only did she mention it, not only did it come up during the course of dinner – but it also became a a 15 minute conversation among the table about how women wished men would still do that and and how people in general should be more polite i think that if if you're a really really polite guy in a world of assholes it stands out yeah it makes you the unique guy it makes you the one who is different and uh yeah that can make you stand out and now john what would be your philosophy on 
I want to say like manhood, but what would your philosophy be on when, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a man in the 21st century, a modern man? To be a man in the 21st century, to me, means trying your best to do your best at everything you do and making a dedicated effort to understand who you are and then not hiding it from the world. Authenticity is an incredibly valuable trait. And I think too many of us hide who we are or don't make a big enough effort to learn who we are. And so we learn to subsume those characters for too long, those characteristics. So being a man is always trying to do your best and and always trying to be real. All right. And John, do you have any last parting piece of guidance for the thousands of listeners today or a final short story? One of my favorite quotes is from a book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. <laughs> and, and it says, until a man is about 25, he still thinks every so often that under the right set of circumstances, he could be the baddest mother in the world. And I, I think that's true. Maybe it, maybe it extends to guys who are as old as 30. I think that because you have a lot of listeners who, who are 30 and, and below, I really think that taking a moment to appreciate the feeling of immortality that that is inherent in being a young guy is awesome. I mean, like you, you can literally do whatever the f- you want. You can change the world in your image. And, and the longer you stay under the yoke of corporate servitude or the yoke of people who like put you down, the harder it is to do that. I don't think that men stop believing they could be the baddest mother f- in the world because they turn 25 and everything changes. I think it's because if by 25 years old, you've let other people tell you what you can't do often enough, you start to believe it. So I still believe that under the right set of circumstances at 32 years old, that I could be the baddest mother in the world because I've made a habit of not letting people tell me that I can't. And that is one of the keys to my success. It's really important to just understand that you can truly, you can literally do anything that you want. And that is something to be celebrated. John, you nailed it right there. And I have this quote on my desktop right now. The universe has no restrictions. You place restrictions on the universe with your expectations by Deepak Chopra. And you're right. You can do anything. Even not being young, just in general, you can do what you want. When people say you can do anything, you're like, oh, well, you can't just fly off the ground. Yeah, but you can build a plane, right, brothers? Okay, like you can do what you want. You can get it done. What is it? What is it that drives you? You can do it. John, that was a great way to end the knowledge round. And now let's go into a little bit more about what are you working on now? Like what's really exciting you when you wake up? I think some really exciting things for me is sort of transitioning away from fitness as as the majority of what I do and moving it more towards a smaller percentage and shifting instead towards other types of writing. There's some secret projects I'm working on that, that I that I can't really say too much about yet, but they are not fitness related, but things that I'm really excited, excited about. But also shifting gears in my business a little bit to help men develop in ways outside of the gym. That's exciting for me. I think you can make a, a large impact on a lot of guys out there, John. And go ahead and give yourself a plug so all the listeners can get in contact with you. For sure. Uh, Guys, thank you again for listening. I really and truly appreciate anyone who has put up with me for this long. If you are not yet sick of me or you are, for whatever reason, interested in any of my content, I'm all over social media. I'm sure that if you've downloaded the podcast, my name is somewhere on it, but it's John Romanello. Uh, Romanello is Roman, like the empire, and then I-E-L-L-O, so that I'm at John Romanello on Twitter and Instagram. If you want pictures of my dogs, that's all I have on Instagram, really. So otherwise, don't bother. I'm on Facebook at official John Romanello. And um, other than that, RomanFitnessSystems.com is the website. I've got some exciting projects, but I think honestly, the one that is most relevant to you is Engineering the Alpha. So if you don't have it yet, and listening to this interview has piqued your interest, and you want to know more about what I have to say. I would love if you uh, if you picked up the book because I think that even if you know many of the things in there, you'll probably glean a nugget or two of wisdom, and that's probably worth twenty bucks. So 
thank you guys for listening and truly, truly hope that you guys got something out of this. All right, John, thank you so much for being on the show and spending the time that you did with my community. This is a little bit longer than normal episode. And for that, I thank you for sharing your lessons and a part of your journey with my community. So thanks, John. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you having me. All right. And that's going to wrap up episode 43 with John Romanello with Roman Fitness Systems. And guys, I've been getting asked repeatedly for the last four months, how am I doing what I did with this podcast? How are you getting these downloads? How are you getting these guests? How are you making money? And I just kind of responded. Instead of just helping each person individually, I thought, why not put together a course that would help people build a podcast like I did so they can go on and impact thousands, if not millions of lives too. So I I put together this comprehensive course and it teaches you how I got over 100,000 downloads per month on average, how I acquire high profile celebrity guests and how I monetize the podcast. Um, You can check it out at thepodcastblueprint.com. And yeah, it's been a long journey and I'm really happy to bring the podcast blueprint to life where I share all the secrets and strategies I use to grow my podcast and just how I do everything that I do step by step. You know, it's been 200 plus hours working on this just in the making and it's about eight hours total of video podcast training content and just, you know, imagine being in the ears of thousands of people every day and interviewing some of your favorite authors and speakers and getting paid to do it. You know, it's just insane and I can't believe this is reality since, you know, I launched this podcast, Knowledge for Men, back in November 2013. So you can check out this podcast course at thepodcastblueprint.com and I do have a special discount for you for the listeners, of course. Use promo code KNOWLEDGE and you can save $25. All right, I hope to see you there. Let's get started. I'll see you in class. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. It's been a pleasure having you be a part of a thriving community of men who want to crush it in all aspects of life. I'm on a mission here to inspire millions of guys. And with your help, we're going to make a dent in the universe. Check out knowledgeformen.com for a ton of free content that's designed to help you live a remarkable life. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com. I hope to see you there. And always remember, 2014 is the official year of the crush, where we take action to get the life we've always dreamed of. This is your host, Andrew Farabee. And until next time, let's do it.